Good evening, everybody. And uh, now that we're tuned in, uh, we're thankful for the ones who are here with us in the sanctuary. And we're very thankful for those of you who are out there in video land. I actually don't like me to say radio land, but that's that, age, that ages me. <laughs> yeah, there you go, internet land or whatever. But anyway, we're glad you joined in with us tonight. And our prayer is that the the class will be a blessing to you. Not because I'm worth anything, but because the word of God is everything. So. Father, it's good to be here tonight, Lord. You're so good to us, Lord. We can never begin to thank you enough. We can't begin to describe, Lord, the wonderful things you've done for us. But, Lord, we try. And, Lord, we just pour out our hearts tonight, Lord, in thanksgiving and praise. And uh, just give you, Lord, glory for all that you've done for us. The Lord, we recognize that you are the sovereign power of the entire universe. And that, Father, it's you that have made us and not we ourselves. We thank you, Lord, that for all that you've done for us. We thank you now, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have of studying it. And we thank you, Lord, for those who are here and those who are tuned in. I pray, Lord, that each and every one will receive some kind of a blessing tonight from having heard the word of God in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to start off tonight on a kind of a tangent. Nothing like starting off on a tangent. Last week, somebody sent us a little text that said, Free Palestine. And I just wanted to tell you all that, you know, I pray for the freeing of Palestine. And I pray for the freeing of Israel. And I pray for, you know, the freeing of Cuba and the freeing of Venezuela. And I pray for the freeing of all people. And uh, it is God's desire to free Palestine as well as all people. And it's not just Palestine. Now, there is a little bit of a problem because Palestine has submitted themselves to their government, like we're going to talk about tonight. But unfortunately, the government Palestine has submitted themselves to us. Hamas and Hamas are not good people. Palestine people are good people, but Hamas is not good people. I roomed with a guy that was from Jordan, Arabia, and uh, he was a good friend, Farouk Diab. Now, I really think a lot of him. Uh, he and I were not on the same page as far as, as our faith goes, but uh, he was a, a nice guy, and I really enjoyed him. He was very, very intelligent. But anyway, uh, I just wanted to share some verses with you about how to free Palestine. Because the Bible, the Bible tells us how to free Palestine. Uh, I don't know whether any other books do it or not. But in, in John chapter 8, verse 31, it says, Then said Jesus to those Jews, and by the way, that's Jews and Gentiles and Palestinians, then said Jesus to those people which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Now look at verse 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So if Palestine wants to be free, they need to know the truth. And where do you get the truth? Well, we, we happen to have found out that that you get freedom and truth from the word of God. Amen. After all, God is our creator. Uh, he is the creator of the world. He is the creator of, the, of life. He is the, the pro-creator of more and more and more life. And so, therefore, he knows what he's talking about. And we need to recognize the authority that he deserves to have over us. And so, therefore, as our creator, he should know something about what's best for us. And so, we, he says in verse 32, that we shall know the truth, and the truth shall make Palestine free, and Israel free, and Afghanistan free, and Cuba free, and all those other places, and the United States free, right? Anyway, 
And then if you go on down, skip down a couple of verses to verse 36. Now this is Jesus speaking, by the way. Now, I know a lot of people don't put any authority on, on Jesus, but trust me, uh, Jesus had a big part in our being. And the fact is, in John chapter 1, it tells us that he was the actual creator of the world, all right? But Jesus says in verse 36, if the Son, and he's referring to himself, the Son of God, if the Son there shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And what's he talking about? He's talking about freedom from sin. He's talking about freedom from the condemnation of going to hell. So I agree. Free Palestine. And let's free all the other countries while we're at it. And uh, because only God and only God's word can truly set people free. And that's been very clear. And I, I, I was 32 years old before I learned that. And I've been learning it for the last, how old am I now? I've been learning it for the last 50, 55, 57 years, I guess. But anyway, it's been a long time. And uh, anyway, I've just come to love with God's word. I come to appreciate what God's done for me. And I am so thankful. Even though I'm bound by taxes, I'm bound by the law when I drive on the highway. I'm bound by all other kinds of laws, dietary laws for one of them, uh, or I'll get obese. I'm bound by everything, but Jesus has set me free. And so I am free from ever having to go to hell. And I'm going to guarantee you there's no better freedom than to know that you're not going to go to hell. A lot of people can't say that. And I don't have to say anymore. I hope I don't go to hell. I can now say because of what God says, I know I'm not going to hell because of the wonderful promises. Anyway, that's that's so much for that. I just want to start off on that note that where true freedom lies, and uh, and freedom does not lie in uh, in one bunch of people shooting at another bunch of people. And by the way, you need to really know the whole fact before you make your judgments on which side of this battle you're on. Let's just take one more little. What happened Saturday night? Well, actually, it was Friday night, wasn't it? Well, it was Saturday. Saturday. Yeah, Saturday morning. Yeah. Do you know Iran sent the best they could to go ahead and wipe Israel off the map like they've been wanting for all these years? How many people got killed in that millions and millions of dollars worth of bombs and rockets and, and uh, uh, drones that they said? How many people did they kill? Not a one. Now, let me ask you this. How on earth does one country bomb the daylights out of another country and not destroy any buildings or kill any people except that God had his hand on it? And God set them, God set Israel free from that barrage of destruction the other night. And uh, that should be a lesson to you. And if that one won't work, then go back to 1967 to the Six Day War. When once again, some of these countries decided to wipe the Jews off of the map once and for all. And uh, after six days, they tucked their tail between their legs and went home, and they lost millions and millions of acres of land. And so they were chasing Israel back into the ocean. They end up losing a lot of their territory. There's only one way that can happen. And the Bible tells us that Israel is God's chosen people. Now, God is angry at Israel because they rejected Jesus. Because Jesus didn't fit what they was looking for, for a Messiah. And so they rejected Jesus. But he was the true Messiah. And those who accepted him found true freedom. Uh, those who didn't are still bound uh, under condemnation. God still loves those Jews. And he's still going to deliver them eventually when they listen to him. Okay. The key comes back to whether or not we listen to God. He says, uh, Jesus said this. 
He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death right into life. Right smack dab in life. The Apostle Paul says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Boom. No 10,000 years anywhere. Right straight out of, from life through death and into a new life. And uh, that's what the Bible promises. And uh, the Bible is the oldest written book we have on record. And uh, and it's been proven accurate over and over and over again. And if, if the if you're going to talk bad about the Bible, I suggest you read it before you talk bad about it. So you know what you're talking bad about. Yeah. You know, you can't you can't condemn the Bible unless you know what it says. And unfortunately, now fortunately, if you start reading it, something might happen that might surprise you. OK, anyway, we're supposed to be in, in uh, Romans chapter 13. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So is the land where the Israelites are right now, is that the promised land? That is the promised land. That was promised by God. It was promised by God to Abraham. Abraham never... Just that part where they're at now, or is it also the surrounding? Well, it, it's it's all of Israel. Uh, actually, it goes, it goes all the way up to the Euphrates River and all the way back down to the, the border of Egypt. And it goes from the river to the sea. That's what God promised Abraham. And uh, Abraham didn't get it. And then God promised it to Isaac and to Jacob. And he promised it to Moses. And Moses didn't even get to go in there. But uh, then the people that Moses led got to go in there and take possession of it. And so they finally, after 450 years, they finally obtained the promised land. Did they gave some of it away? Well, they, because they were disobedient to God, and, uh, and turned from God, God has kicked them out of the land twice. The last time he kicked them out, they were out for 2,000 years. Well, about 1,950 years. And they went back in in 1948, right? In 1948, they, they came back into, the, into their promised land. And uh, why has the world been angry at Israel all these years because God gave Israel those wonderful promises Satan has done his best to try to destroy Israel and Israel survived 2,000 years without a homeland and every Jew knew that he was a Jew now when we lose our homeland in two or three generations, we've forgotten it. But uh, not those Jews. Why? Because they're God's chosen people. Now, the church is also God's chosen people because the church are those who people who accepted Jesus, those Jews who accepted him and believed on him and became a part of the church. And so now the church is also God's chosen people. And so God is blessing both the church and Israel. And what? He, bought us. he did bought us. He he paid a tremendous price for us. And and if you don't know what he paid for us, you should go back and read your Bible about Jesus being hung on the cross. And that's how he bought us. He was willing to be nailed to that cross to buy us back from the devil, because the uh, what do you call it when the computer automatically does something? No, the it goes past the what is the automatic thing that happens when you don't make a decision? And anyway, I forget the word now. Anyway, computer word, and my memory's failing me, has been for a long time. But anyway, the natural state of a man is lost. The Bible says we are born dead in trespasses and sin until. We come to Christ and accept what he did on the cross for us. And then we have that freedom. And it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. Okay. Romans chapter 13. Now, it's interesting. We're talking about government. 
because that's what Romans chapter 13 is about. Default. Thank you, ma'am. The default. The default. <laughs> it, it eventually comes in, right? Y'all don't know it, but you're talking about your old people over here. All oh, except for Nancy. She's yeah. not she's not elderly. <laughs> she's middle age. Oh. <laughs> Almost. No, I am. Oh, are you okay? <laughs> So anyway, the default for every man, woman, and child born is a condition of being lost. And the default is hell unless people accept Jesus. And uh, and that goes for I don't I don't care whether you're whether you're Mormon, Jehovah's Witness, Muslim, Hindu, part uh, of the Chinese, uh, Buddhist. I don't care what you are. There's only one salvation, only one God, and there's only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. Okay, let's get on to chapter 13. You know, uh, Sunday was the Ides of April. No, Monday was, excuse me, Monday. Monday was tax day. That's the day we don't look forward to. Nobody likes to have to pay all them taxes to the government. You know, I don't mind paying taxes. I just don't like the way the government spends them. And, uh, you know, I'm willing to pay taxes to, to support our officials. I'm willing to pay taxes to support our military. I'm willing to pay taxes to support our space exploration and all these other developments. I am not willing to pay taxes to pay for abortion. I'm not willing to pay taxes for transgender operations. Those things I should not have to pay taxes for. And uh, But anyway, some people think so, but not me. So as far as government, I believe in government. God believes in government. People have wrongly assumed that the amendment that says there's a separation between church and state means the church has no part in politics. That is not true. Separation of church and state means that the government will not make a state church because the English had a state church. Uh, the French had a state church. The Spaniards had a state church. All these people had a state church. And our forefather says we should have the right to seek God the way that we feel God wants us to seek it. Therefore, the government cannot set up a state church. And that's all that amendment is. It does not mean that the church should not have a say in politics. What would happen if there was no Christian influence in politics? I'll guarantee you uh, they would have a heyday. I mean, this would be the awfulest place to live in the world without some positive Christian God ordained natures put into practice because of Christians is involved in politics. And so yes, the church should be involved in politics because uh, that's what keeps a little bit of honesty in government. Chapter 13 verse one, we're talking about submission to authorities. Now again, uh, the Palestinians chose to be, become submissive to Hamas. Big mistake. Hamas is a wicked government. The Palestinians are good people. They just submitted to the wrong government. Now, it says here, let every soul be subject to the higher powers. Now, of course, really to us, the higher powers would be who? Be God. Okay? So we automatically as Christians are subject to God. But here he's talking about higher powers being our government. Because the rest, the rest of the verse says, For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. In other words, God establishes government. You know, we uh, we sometimes don't like the way the elections come out. And sometimes God gives us what we deserve. 
And we say, oh my goodness, I can't believe this and this and this happened. God says, hey, that's what you want. I'll let you have it and see how you like it. If you ever read the book of Judges, you find out that the, the theme in Judges was, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And boy, was that 300 years a mess. And uh, and the people kept doing, well, yeah, I know God said this, but we're going to do this. And boy, the next thing they knew, they were burning their kids to, to these false gods. And they were uh, doing all kinds of strange stuff. Worshiping wood, worshiping stone, worshiping gold, worshiping silver, worshiping everything but God. And then God would bring them back to him. And then, boy, in another generation or so, boom, they're going right back before. Remember, the default is always a person. You could be the strongest Christian in the world, but your children have to do business with God on their own. You can't do it for them. You can influence them. You can raise them, but they have to make the decision. And sometimes, uh, as in the case of Eli, the priest, his sons were rotten to the core. Samuel, great prophet Samuel, sons were bad. And David, oh my, what a wonderful, great King David was. And Israel still thinks the world of David. They got a hotel named after him. And boy, you know, everything's all David. Did a lousy job with his children. And you, and you wonder, what? it's because each person has to make their own decision for the Lord. And so if you're wondering why your kids are going bad, well, that's because you're letting them make all their own decisions without giving them some good positive influence. And it's our, our job as parents to try to help guide them into making the right decision. We can't make the decision for them, but we're going to help guide them into it. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers. No power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. You mean God let Hitler rule Germany? Yes, he did. Why? Because the people had gotten this superior attitude about themselves that they were superior to everybody else. And they thought we should rule the world because we're better than everybody. And God says, okay. I'll put a man up here that you're going to think is even better than all of y'all. And boy, look where Hitler got us. 25 million people died because of Hitler. And uh, what we had three and a half years of horrible war because of Hitler. And then, of course, that, uh, what was it? Hiromoto, or what was that Japanese emperor's name? Hirohito. Hirohito. Yeah. And uh, he also thought he was a god and they set themselves as god up as god and that's god says hey you worship me if you're not going to worship me i'm going to give you a bad government so anyway god's god institutes the government and if we if we allow god to and we serve god god will give us good government and uh and unfortunately a large part of our population is not pro god and therefore our government Sometimes it's not pro God either. Okay, let's move on. Verse two. Yes. God says, I am their king. But they don't want to trust me. They don't want to serve me. They want to be like the world. And that's a really good point, Marita, because God says, Israel, your special people. I'm going to be your king. And what did they say? No, we want to be like all the rest of the world. We want to have a king like all the rest of the world. God says, no, I'm your king. We want a human king. And boy, did they have some lose. Now, they had some good ones like David, and Josiah, and Asa, and Jehoshaphat, and some of those guys. But they also had Manasseh. They had Ahab. And oh, goodness, and Ahaz. You name it, they had some real Lulus. And uh, so uh, it, it pays to keep our focus on God. I was going to tell you something. 
I know that you read those horrible first nine chapters of Chronicles, okay? That was Monday, right? All right, now, do you get very much out of that? It, it, well, it's ho-hum. It's ho-hum. It's thousands and thousands of names. Somebody forget so-and-so and so-and-so. I spotted some things. There was one in there that I I really tried to pay attention as I read through there and see what I recognized. What was Samuel's first oldest boy's name? Joel. Okay. We find out that Joel had a son named Heman. David appointed Heman to be the head of the the choir. So Joel had a good son, yeah. and David saw it and used his talents in the music industry. And uh and and you know I found out something else this time. Because I had always assumed that I wonder why did Samuel offer sacrifices? He wasn't a priest. Only the priests were supposed to offer sacrifices, the sons of Aaron. I says that's a that's that's not right. Why was Samuel? Well, then see, we assumed Elkanah being from Ephraim that he was an Ephraimite. He wasn't. He was a son of Kohath, a descendant of Kohath. So Samuel was a descendant of, of uh, Aaron. And, he had both responsibilities. Yeah, he he had uh, both judge and prophet, and plus he had sort of played king sometimes too. And uh, he had to put out the fires, but Samuel was quite a character. And anyway, I was got a thrill out of learning some things I learned in Chronicles about Samuel. And there were two or three other points I discovered about. I was sharing them with Baxter the other day. And, and uh, so, you know, there are little pieces in there you get something out of. Okay. Uh, verse 2 Whosoever there that resisted the power resisted the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. God says, if you resist the government, you're going to have problems. <laughs> now, unfortunately, we got people resisting the government. Oh, we got some terrible things going on in our society today. You know, the, uh, it's, it seems like evil. By the way, this is a prophecy. There is a prophecy in the book of Isaiah. It says there will be a day come when evil would be called good and good would be called evil. And that is today. Because one guy is on trial for some comment he made and other people being turned free to go out and kill again. And so it looks to me like we're trying to blame the wrong guy. We're trying to hang the wrong guy. And the criminals being turned loose, just like these uh, that poor nursing student that got killed here a couple of months ago. I forget now. Yeah. And uh, and there's been so many other things. And, and these guys have been captured and released. And they go back into society and do it all. And then here a guy comes along and he makes some comments about he didn't like the way the election went. And so now he's on trial. And they want to put him in jail so he can't campaign. So, you know, right is being called wrong and wrong is being called right. Our society has a terrible problem. But we still have a government and we still are subject to it. Yes, ma'am. What? So, if that's, if that's the case, then, then our founding fathers should never have rebelled against the government. Well, you, you got a point. Except their government was in another country. It was, it was uh, their... Sometimes government goes over overboard, and the English government went overboard with the colonies, and that's why they rebelled against them. By the way, you know the, where that biggest part of that rebellion started? From pastors preaching against that government of power. And uh, because the, 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 a lot of times when you got a government on the other side of the world trying to run you, and you got a problem there. Uh, I know when I was in the Philippines, uh, 
people told us that, you know, the United States tried to run the Philippines. And, you know, in a sense of the way, word, there was a time when the United States was trying to run the Philippines. And so we turned them loose. And uh, they've had their problems since then. You know, they haven't having a hard time governing themselves. The fact is, Japan took them over a while after we set them free. Anyway, God says, if you go against your government, you're going to receive a damnation. Now, suppose your government's bad. I mean, the Bible says that bad government is better than no government. And we wonder about that sometimes, but some governments get really, really bad. And when that happens, then God's people should stand up and try to bring it around. Governments go bad because God's people keep their mouths shut. And uh, I remember, was it back in the 60s? They started talking about the silent majority. Everybody was speaking up and making a big fuss. And there was a bunch of people not saying anything. Who was it? It was the Christians. They were sitting back and saying, hmm, hmm, oh, hmm, hmm. And the silent majority has allowed the unsilent majority to throw everything in the, out, of, out of welter. So anyway, if this is a lesson in uh, what's that class you call it? Study in, uh, in civics. Lesson in civics, okay. By the way, God wants to be in charge. Whether he is or not depends upon us. Now, we as Christians, even though we're subject to our government, we don't worry about it. Why? Because our true government is God. And Washington is our secondary government. Now, my understanding is as long as Washington doesn't go too far we're to be subject to them but when they start telling me that i can't we can't open our church you remember when covid came and they closed the churches and there were some that didn't close now i understand that we only would close what one sunday or two sundays and uh but then we we decided to go back to meeting even though the government had said uh, no public meetings and they they said you can have a fourth of july picnic but only have six people <laughs> well that's not much of a fourth of july picnic uh, but but see that <laughs> oh yes <laughs> yeah all right and, and that's when the government oversteps their bounds and that's when people say whoa that's enough we 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 don't we'll not follow that so John MacArthur never closed his church. Shadow Mountain Bible Church, I don't think, ever closed his church. And several others said, we're not closed it. And so the government couldn't, they couldn't do anything about it. But they took precautions. Well, they did take precautions, yeah. yes. Well, we took a precaution here. We, we installed an air purification system in our building. And so the air you breathe here is better than what you breathe outside, okay? And because so we've got a purifying system set up, which it cost a little bit of money, but we felt like it was worth it when that COVID thing was going on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, definitely. With uh, <laughs> Well, the government finances a lot of things that's not good. Uh, Oh, goodness. About a school library having books about sex and pornography and all this stuff. It did hurt me so bad. It's a wonder I didn't end up going to jail. A brother brought a book to me one time and said, My son brought this book home. And he said, I was looking at it and I want to show you what he's some son. And I couldn't believe it. It was in the school library, PSJA. Yeah, it's was back in the early 70s. Oh, wow. That long? Yeah. And uh, it was at the PSJ library, and it was a book on, well, it's it just a book on how to do things that we really like to have our children doing. And it was in the library. I said, well, what's this book in the library? 
that has a right to be there, freedom of speech. But then they won't let a teacher put a Bible on their desk. But they can have that horrible stuff in the library. They can have a Bible on their desk. And so I burned that book. And it had PSGA library stamped all over it. And I thought, you know, they could come get me for this. I guess I better shut up. This might not over here. <laughs> well, I think the, uh, what do they call it? The, Find out. Huh? No, I mean, the law. Yeah, the, the law. Of, something's over. It's over too late. Yeah. Okay, let's go on to verse 3. Verse 3 says, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil works. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. You know, if we obey the law, there's no problem. No. I've been stopped by cops before. And I'm very, very respectful to them. I was in the military. I learned how to respect in the military. I got stopped in Brawley, California. I stopped to eat breakfast. I was by myself. And when I came back out, there was a, a state California State Police car sitting behind me. Just sitting there. I didn't think of that. I got in my car and it cranked up. Boy, he pulled out and blocked me. So I couldn't leave. I started to get out of the car and he jumped and he says, get back in the car and put your hands on the steering wheel. I said, what is going on? And I says, could you tell me what's going on? He says, you just sit there. He says, there's a guy coming from What's that place on the California border down uh, where the, I, I can't even name it now. I don't know the name of it. Been there thousands of times. But anyway, uh, I had picked up a hitchhiker in Texas, and he rode to that town with me. And he got off at the bus station, and then I went north up towards Barley, and this one going across to Santa Ana. And uh, somebody had seen him get out of my car, and they saw the license, and they called it in. And so the California Highway Patrol had blocked me so until a sheriff came all the way from Yuma. Oh, yeah. He had to come all the way from Yuma to Brawley, I think about three hours, to bring this guy up there to identify Vash's suitcase. Her suitcase was in the back seat of my car. And it has her initials are V-I-N when she was single. And because my name was Lancaster, those initials didn't amount. And somebody accused me of stealing that suitcase. And so they brought that guy all the way up and looked at it and he said, no, nope, that's not my suitcase. He got in the car and they left him back to Yuma. I says, is there no worse sorry? No, sorry we delayed you. The cop got in his car and left. I was pretty unhappy, but I still respected the law, and I sat there with my hands on that steering wheel so that guy from Yuma got there. Now, if these guys that they've been getting killed lately would submit to those authorities, they wouldn't choke them to death or shoot them or whatever. And uh, But no, people don't want to submit to the authority. They like to smart off to them and show them how, how big and macho I am, you know, and, and call them all the names they can think of and throw things at them. And, and, uh, well, back in the day, you used to be able to, you used to respect teachers. Yes, you did. Go to school and you would respect the teachers. Nowadays, there's no respect. There's no respect. They, 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 and you wouldn't trust, you wouldn't trust your 15 year old girl to ride home with a school teacher. No, not anymore. Not anymore. But man, that, nobody ever thought anything about it when I was growing up. If a, if a girl missed the bus, one of the teachers would drive her home. Another, nobody, not a question. But boy, you don't do it anymore. Goodness. Anyway, so if if we if we're obedient, the law is not bad to us. Now it's when we go crossways with the law, then we have trouble. Now, I don't mind telling you, I've gotten crossways with the law a few times, but it was usually a misunderstanding, and uh, I got stopped in Reynosa one time and pulled over. And boy, I'm not kidding you, they took my van apart. 
And they went through it. Through it. Now, these were Federals. And anyway, they made me stand outside, and uh, and they sat there, and boy, they searched it. I had $60 in my ashtray, cash. I said, well, there goes my 60 bucks. <laughs> and uh, but anyway, when I got back in the van, my 60 bucks was laying on the on the console. Huh? And the van was a little disturbed, but the guy said, we're sorry. We've checked. We had the wrong van. Oh. He says, we had a description of a van just like yours, but we got the license number now. And yours is not the one. And they apologized. And you know, I appreciated that. That was Mexican Federalis. And that happened right there and just coming into Rio Nosa. Coming from Monterey, right? Okay, anyway. Verse four. Now, verse four. For he is the minister of God. Now, who's he talking about? Who's the minister of God? He's talking about government. For the government is the minister of God to thee for good. Government basically is good. They make laws to make sure you don't drive too fast. They make laws that tells you you should not drive while you're drinking. And they make laws. The laws are to protect the innocent people. And uh, yeah, for public protection. Okay. Uh, and so the, the, the government is a minister of God's evil good. But if thou do that which is evil, then you can be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, the revenger to execute wrath upon them that doeth evil. And so you get crossways with the government, then, and just like some of these kids that have gotten crossways with the government, uh, they've been on high on drugs, uh, they've been abusive, they've been fighting government, and some of them end up getting killed, and then we have horrible riots and so forth. And hey, the news media doesn't bring out the fact that that that. That guy was violent and fighting when those guys throwed him down on the ground and held him. Uh, the news media only brings up the cops were bad and they killed that guy. Well, they don't bring out the fact that guy was being really, really violent towards the cops. Verse 5. Wherefore, you must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience. And, you know, our conscience should be our guide. Theoretically, we shouldn't need laws. The, the conscience of love your neighbor as you love yourself, the, the the law of love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your that should be enough to make us good, worthwhile citizens. And, and that will work for some people, but for some people it won't work. Because they say, oh, well, you know, if it's not any laws, I'm going to drive 100 miles an hour down the entire road. And all the potholes are going to get you. <laughs> but, uh, well, the, the speed limit used to be 45 on Tower Road. And there got to be so many potholes, they lowered it to 30. <laughs> and I got stopped one time for doing about 37. But he was nice, and I was nice to him. Verse 6, for this cause we pay, for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attended continually upon this very thing. Now this brings us back to what did Jesus say? Remember they brought a, they came to Jesus and said, is it right to pay taxes? And then and Jesus says, show me a coin. They showed him a coin, says, whose picture is it? Well, that's Caesar. He says, give back to Caesar, that which is Caesar. Now if you got a, got a coin that's got God's picture on it, you have to give that one to God, okay? But anyway, the, the idea was you give to God what is God's. And what does God say is his? Well, he says it's all his, but he allows us to keep 90%. And he says that we, now that was in the Old Testament. He said we should give 10%. Now, in the New Testament, we don't have tithe. In the New Testament, we have giving. And that's very different. You you give out of a generous heart, Uh you tithe sometimes reluctantly, and just like you pay taxes reluctantly. And uh, I don't know whether it'd be possible to have a society where people just just gave to the government to fund it. <laughs> back in the day, it used to be voluntary. Well, but back before the back, you know, back in the, in the early American, you're right. It was mainly carried on by people giving to the government, Landowner. and uh, it was yeah, you know, landowners so forth paid on it. To, 
because government helped control things. And so, but then they come in and put all these taxes on it, made it kind of an unpleasant thing after that. And they did go a little overboard. 50% should have been enough, but they, what is it, 52% or something like that? Time you figure everything in? Huh? Oh, is it? It is. And the property tax has gotten really bad, but well, the ones on our house, I can't believe our houses, our taxes are so cheap. Well, because George Bush, when he was governor, he passed that law that if you're over 65, you could lock your taxes in for a lifetime. And boy, I ran down there as fast as I could go. <laughs> and our, the taxes on our house are about a fifth of what they're on the house next door. Which is was after mother's house because that's our homestead, but uh, the other taxes are very high. <laughs> so our home taxes are very very low because of that one law, which by the way did away with that George Bush went out of office. So anyway, we're we're to pay tribute. Why? Because well. Government has to have folks. There has to be a military. Unfortunately, there has to be a military because if you don't have a military, somebody's going to come in and take over. And so you have to have a military to protect your borders. And you have to have local police. You have to have certain things that you, you got to have, and they, they need to be paid. And so there needs to be some kind of taxes, some kind of tribute. Uh, I don't mind saying that it's gotten out of control. You know, when they passed Roe versus Wade, Congress says government money will never be used to pay for abortion. And they will still tell you that government money is not used to be paid for abortion. But money, the government funds Planned Parenthood who pays for abortions. You know, you, you can't win. That's right, it comes around the back door. Verse 7. Render therefore to all their duties, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor unto whom honor. Well, how about that one? We should honor our military. We should honor our policemen. We should honor our officials. We should honor our courts, our judges, and yet we have a tendency to, well, we talk bad about them, don't we? And, uh, well, sometimes they deserve being talk bad about it, but, uh, but I know that uh, uh, when I went in the military, I got paid $78 a month. And uh, for that, I could go get shot at. Now, when Kennedy became president, and I did not vote for Kennedy, but I liked him. He was a good president. But the first thing he did, he became president, he gave the military a raise. I'm going to guarantee you he won the hearts of all the military people because we all felt like we were under underpaid. And uh, But I was still underpaid. When I got out, after four years, I was still making $211 a month. So, and 60 of that to what the bash did. <laughs> that, that concludes the first paragraph. The second paragraph is talking about fulfilling the law. Now, here's a good point. Owe no man anything but to love one another. Uh if, if you borrow money from somebody, you pay them back. And uh, But the only thing that you should owe them is love or respect or honor. We should freely give that. And uh, I like the verse where, you know, in, in this church, nobody gets paid except the people that clean and uh, keep the yard. Everybody else works for free. And um, that's the way I wanted it. And that's the way it's been ever since. And nobody's questioned it. Is it? 
and uh, I, and I like it that way. Why? And that's and, and we have never lacked for funds in this church. This church has never borrowed a nickel since we started. We bought everything right up front. We bought this property, we bought this building, everything, and we paid cash for it because we told God that we were not going to beg for money. People were just free to give it. And guess what? And they have. I've had brothers, do you mean you want to take up one offer in a week? I said, man, what about the Sunday night and Wednesday? I don't want to take up offers on that. Why? If they want to give, they can give Sunday morning. You know, I, I wanted to just put a box back in the back. But somebody said, oh, we need to stick traditionally to the pass in the bag. So we do that. But I thought, well, you know, if people want to give, uh, they can do it just by going through and dropping it in the box. By the way, it's biblical. That's what, uh, who was it? King King jo Joash. Joash. And uh, Jehoiada, Jehoiada the priest. They set up a chest, put a hole in it. People just walked by and dropped their money in it. And they had plenty. And uh, that was kind of what I wanted to do. But no, the guy said, no, we better go ahead. Well, they didn't take one offer. So we agreed only one offer in the week. That's more and, and what? That's more convenient. Yeah. You're walking out shaking hands. Well, that's true. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, it's, uh, and we do not believe in begging for money. We give you the opportunity to give, and that's it. And, uh, we do not, we do not beg for money. Now, we sometimes mention a, a need, and people give to it. I know we mentioned about Benito's wife here a while back, and, uh, the church sent some money. We had some other people gave some money. That uh, went down there to help pay their expenses. Cause, uh, by the way, she's home, and uh, she's doing good, looking good, eating again, and uh, she probably weighs what about a hundred pounds. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but anyway, she's uh, looks like she may get a lease on life. I I was pretty sure she was a donor. Well, it's a couple we knew, and they've been real close to us ever since. 1988 and uh I knew them when uh down in guadalajara i met them and uh but they live in Reynosa, and uh they've been involved with us for all these years but he lost his papers and uh but she got real sick and uh and we, we were pretty sure she was going to die cancer, like stomach, the operation yeah. stomach, and the never came out just quite right but anyway, they're doing pretty good. They're in there. Well, they're. Is he older or younger than you? A little bit younger. Okay. And so his wife is probably younger too. Yeah. Anyway, that's, anyway, she's doing very well, so that's good. So, um, what, tell me again, what kind of surgery was your mother having? She, she had some kind of surgery with her. Oh, a stent. Well, you know, that's not that serious stuff, too. And uh, well, there's people that had serious problems with those with those uh, procedures. So the only debt we should owe is to love somebody. Okay, I'm indebted to you. Verse nine: For this, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness, which is lying. And I know people that the first thing out of their mouth when you ask them something is a lie. They always start out by lying and then they finally admit to something. Thou shalt not covet. Oh, that's a bad one here in the United States. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, Lamey, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And if we did that, if we loved our neighbor as ourself, we would have a great world. You you wouldn't steal because you loved your neighbor. You wouldn't run off with his wife because you loved your neighbor. If you love your, your neighbor, you can love his wife, but only as a as your neighbor's wife, okay? <laughs> and uh we would be honest if we really loved them, but we don't. Everybody oh, they love themselves and they want all they can get out of it. A fellow told me one time, he says, 
Oh, no. He says, I don't see anything wrong with stealing. He says, they got more than I have. And that was his, that was his justification for stealing. And he was always stealing from Walmart and other places. And, uh, and I was with him one time. And what's that grocery store over here in Far? Uh, not, not Junior's. But uh, anyway, the grocery store in there in Far. And I was there with him. And when we walked through the door, a clerk was assigned to follow him everywhere he went. And he'd walk along and he'd pick up something and look at it. Smile and put it back on the shelf. And they, because he had stolen from them so many times. And and he says, hey, they got more than I have, so it's all right to steal from them. Now that's not the way it works, folks. If you love somebody, you don't steal from them. The fact is, when you love somebody, you do everything you can to make their life better. I believe. Verse 10. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And you stop and think about it. With the love, the law is not necessary. And, uh, and unfortunately, we have the old Adamic nature, which is, is uh, me first, and uh, uh, greed. And oh man, I see the greed in some people. Uh, I, I gave a guy, guy come to me one time and says, Man, I need some work. And so my son and I were going to put a roof on a house in Alamo. I said, okay, well, you can help us. We don't really need you, but we'll give you work. And so at the end of the day, uh, I paid my son, and I was paying him $10 an hour. And so I paid this guy $10 an hour also. He looked at me, he's not worth more than this. I says, do you know more about putting that roof on than I do? He said, no, but I'm worth more than this. I said, well, you got paid that only by my goodness because my son knows how to do this, and we had to tell you everything to do. I said, I should have only paid you $3 a day. That's all you were worth. I mean, $3 an hour. That's all you're worth. But he wanted $15 an hour. He should go to McDonald's. Verse 11, and that thou knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Isn't that a neat verse? But my, uh, my salvation is 57 years now, years nearer now than it was when I believed. And, uh, and I keep wondering why it's waiting. You know what? Lord, we're going to wait for 58. <laughs> but uh, anyway, he'll come when he's ready. Now he'll take me when he's ready. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. In other words, stop lying. Stop cheating. Stop stealing. Stop being, disres stop being disrespectful. I uh, sit in a classroom a couple of times and that boy was staying with us and having trouble in the classroom and so I, the, the principal asked me if I would sit in the classroom and try to make him behave. But there was a kid in that classroom that just kept that class total uproar. He'd get up, walk up, he'd grab somebody's desk and turn it over with him sitting in it. And they couldn't do anything about it. And I got into real trouble. I grabbed him by the hand, I drug him back to the bathroom in the back of the room. And he started fighting me, and I pinned him to the floor, and I held him there, and the teacher ran to get the principal. <laughs> and I was told not to come back anymore. I says, how come you let that kid act that way? She said, well, that's the way. I said, he's that way because he can get away with it. I said, if you burn his bottom, I says, he'll behave himself. But he has no respect for you. Some of the teachers I respected most in my school years were the ones that were the hardest on me. And then what year was that? Back in the 
Oh, when uh, that was a, the dawn of school back in, would have been in the 80s, around 85, 86, and we're back in there. Yeah. It was one of those special ed classes. They had three teachers, and those teachers were not doing a thing in the world to control that kid. But, well, yes, they do. They're not allowed to touch them. But um, I didn't follow the rules. <laughs> Huh? Now nobody told me that rule. I just I just couldn't stand to see that kid. I mean, he was gonna hurt somebody. Little girl sitting at a desk and he grabbed it, flipped it, and flipped her across the floor. And all he got was he shouldn't do that. Well, I took him back to the bathroom and visited. You wanna know something good? Was a couple of months after that, his mother's ex-husband had taken her car to Brownsville, and she wanted it back. That boy called me and asked me if I would take him down there to get that car back. Why did he call me? Because he respected me, because I didn't let him get away with that bad behavior. And I asked him, wait, I said, why did you call me? He said, well, I just kind of like you. And you thought he's supposed to hate me, right? Okay, let's see. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in clamoring and wantonness, not in strife and envy. And there it is, strife and envy. We talked about that in James the other night. What's one of the big problems of the church today? Strife and envy. But put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh, to fulfill the lust thereof. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 3. Put off, put on. Put off, put on. You ever read Colossians chapter 3? Put off this, put on this. Put off this, put on this. And this is what we should put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh. And that finishes up chapter 13. And we'll be ready for chapter 14 next week. Uh, I hope you folks out there, and I'm not going to say radio land, I'm going to say video land or, or uh, internet land, right? Hope you all enjoyed it, and uh, trust that uh, the Lord will bless you richly. Father, it's good to be here tonight. Pray Lord for your blessings upon us as we go to our homes. Lord, give us a good night's rest and take care of us. And Father, just uh, continue to provide for us. And Lord, Teach us, teach us to owe no man nothing but love. And Father, help us to love one another and fulfill the law uh, of the Old Testament. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things I thought I could never do.